Now we're going to look at the uh, the idea of creating a confidence interval for a binomial uh, variable. That's a variable that's dichotomic. I take an example here. The uh, the question was would be Canadians having mother tongue English or first language learned and still used English or not? And the answer to that question is going to be dichotomic and According to Statistics Canada, the data for all Canadians is uh, 58%. That means 58% of, of Canadians have English as a mother tongue, and the other 40%, 42% have some other language other than English. So uh, we can look at this in terms of a dichotomic variable where x is equal to 1 if the person answers that English is their mother tongue, and let's say x, random variable, uh, is uh, any other answer. So uh, I've drawn the relative frequency here. Now, of course, we have the entire population, all of Canada. So in actual fact, this would be the proportion or the probability. You can see the histogram is drawn here and put 58% to 0.58. We can call this pi because it's the population proportion. It's a Greek letter. Uh, now, we could write this uh, random variable x because it's equal to either 0 or 1 as a binomial with uh, the parameter of pi. And this, In the case of the binomial, it's so simple, this uh, probability density function, is that uh, with this one parameter pi, equal in this case of 0 0.58, we know virtually everything about, about, the, about the variable. Take a quick glance at what these various parameters would be. The population mean, population proportion, is pi. The variance is pi times 1 minus pi, and then this population standard deviation, normally sigma, is equal to the square root of the variance. Uh, keep in mind, though, that uh, if we compare it with a normal, uh, a normal random variable, it requires two parameters, uh, the population mean and the population standard deviation. So the binomial is an extremely simple uh, random variable. Let's take an example of this, this idea of the language. We'll pursue it uh, in the case of the binomial. Uh, once again, x is equal to 1 if the person answers that English is the mother tongue, 0 if they answer anything else. Uh, we happen to know in advance that uh, pi is equal. To, and keep bear in mind, too, this pi is not 3.14158. It's, it's, a, it's a proportion variable, and it has to vary between 0 and 1. So uh, using the weighted method for calculating the, the two moments, we do it the first moment. We can say the proportion of people when x is equal to 0 is 0.42. Proportion when x is equal to 1 is 0.58. You take the value of x times the pr proportion of the relative frequency, and then we get the multiply, add these together, and we find out that 0 0.58 is the population mean, or would be the weighted mean. Calculate the second moment, we would say, well, first take the difference between the the mean and the value. So for zero would be zero minus 0 0.58. We've got 0 0.58 here, for example. And uh, one times, uh, uh, rather, uh, 0.58 minus uh, the mean is Rather, 1 minus 0.58 is 0.42. That's correct. When x is equal to 1, uh, then we'd square the deviation. This is initially the deviation. Square the deviation, then take the deviation times the weighted amount. And this uh, number at the end, 2.3, is equal to the population variance. And we take the square root of that, and uh, we wind up with the population standard deviation. So in fact, using the weighted method, it's, it's, it's so simple that it, it appears even confusing. Um, we can now use the central limit theorem uh, to estimate, for example, a group of Canadians. So imagine we're outside of Canada. There's 100 Canadians, random sample from all over the country. What percentage of this group will have English as their mother tongue? So now we're in the world of a sample, and we're looking at a sample mean. In this case, actually a sample proportion. So uh, we would expect it to be about 58% or around 58 people of the 100. But of course, it would not be exactly that. There might be more, there might be less. It's a random sample. Let's call the number of people in this group of 100 a sample proportion or sample mean. According to the central limit, then when n is larger, larger than 50, in fact, we've got 100 people in our sample, we can use the, uh, we, can, we would expect that this sample proportion, notice this carefully, sample proportion p bar will follow the normal centered on pi with a standard error equal to the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. 
So we've just applied the central limit theorem to the situation of p bar. Now, this is the population mean. We got that from Statistics Canada. This is going to be a population standard deviation, as I just derived a moment ago. Uh, this becomes now our standard error in the case of the binomial or dichotomic variable. So, important point to re reiterate here is that uh, we can rewrite this p bar follows the normal. Keep in mind that x bar, on the other hand, that means to say an individual person will follow th the binomial distribution. p bar, of course, is based on a sample of 100 people. So it's a proportion, sample proportion. Okay, now we can create a, a, a confidence interval uh, using the calculations on the previous screen. Uh, confidence interval is the population mean plus or minus uh, the margin of error, where we've got the standard error as shown previously. We can choose a, a Z from the critical table. Uh, depending on the confidence level. So, say for example we choose the 90% level of confidence, then we would uh, write the lower bound as being 0 0.58, 1.645, that's alpha divided by 2, um, when uh, alpha is equal to 10%, 90% level, times 0 0.49. I've rounded the square root of 100 is 10, so 0.49 divided by 10 uh, rounded as and when we multiply this out, we would get uh, 0.58 uh, minus 0 0.8, which is roughly 0 0.5. And uh, for the upper bound, we would add the margin of error, which would mean we'd be adding roughly 0 0.8. So we could put this in as equal to roughly 0 0.50, and this is going to equal roughly 0 0.66. So this would mean that uh, we would expect, if we were traveling abroad, a random group of 100 Canadians, you'd expect that roughly 50 of them, nine groups out of 10, uh, 50 of the people would have a, English as a mother tongue, and 66 would have, uh, or somewhere between 50 and 66 of the 100 people would have English as a mother tongue. One way to view this as well is to say that if, for example, you're abroad and you meet a gr group of people where uh, there's fewer than 50 or fewer than maybe 45 that speak English as a mother tongue, then you start to think, well, maybe this group of the 100 people on the bus uh, or in this train or whatever uh, 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 are not really a random sample of Canadians from all across the country. Uh, I want to make two points about this. Uh, the first one is that the, uh, in the case of the binomial PDF, it happens that the largest population standard deviation is equal to 0 0.5. I'm going to leave that as a, as, as a, a bonus quiz if you want to show it or prove it. Um, but this is the case, which means that if we want to make the margin of error as wide as possible, which is a way of making it safe so that we're including every possibility, we can simply state that rather than calculate the population standard deviation, if we don't know it, we can just put in 0 0.5. Uh, uh, the second thing is frequently don't know the population proportion. In the previous example, we happen to know it because Statistics Canada provides the data. But in many circumstances, we don't know it. In which case, what we will we'll do in this case is to, rather than use the unknown population mean or proportion, we'll simply use the known sample mean or proportion. That is available from the sample that we've created. So we can cr now create a confidence interval not around the unknown population mean, but rather around the known sample mean. So this is the final version of the confidence interval that we would normally use, as illustrated here. Uh, let's take an example from, from newspaper reports of, a, a, of a, an election, and in, in, I think in uh, uh, the, the election in 2015, uh, there was a poll conducted by the Globe and Mail newspaper, but it was conducted by the company Nanos. In their sample size, they had 734. I got this information out of the news report, of which, of the 734, 271 chose liberal, and the other people chose something not liberal. So that could include people that were planning to vote for another political party, or simply planning not to vote, or they hadn't decided, and so on and so forth. Uh, so... 
using the example we had a moment ago, this is the confidence interval I'm going to use. Clearly, we don't know what the final proportion is going to be. That would be pi uh, until the election day that night. That's when everybody gets surveyed. Uh, but this is the three days before the election, so all we know is the uh, is the sample proportion. So let's see what we got this. What is the sample proportion in this case? Well, we're going to have 271 people have chosen liberal out of 734 possibles. And that gives us uh, a proportion, 271 divided by 734, 0 0.36, I think it's 369, according to my calculator, 3692. So that's our sample proportion. Now, what is going to be the confidence level? Well, let's choose 95%. Why not? Look that up in the table. Uh, it's going to be uh, 0 0.05 divided by 2, 2.5% on either side. You've got the table for the Z, it's going to be 1.96. Next, um, uh, what is the estimated standard error? Well, we know that uh, sample size is 734, so it's going to be 0 0.5 divided by uh, the square root of 734 is the sample size, and that, using a calculator, turns out to be 0 0.5. One eight four five, I believe, according to my calculator. That's right. So now we can figure out the margin of error. It's going to be the uh, the standard error uh, multiplied by z. It's going to be these two numbers multiplied together. If I do that, I get one point nine six multiplied by zero point one eight four five. I think I'll round this, and I get. Um, 0 0.036, 0 0.036. So we can now put these together with the sample proportion and create a confidence interval. The lower bound is going to be um, 0 0.369 minus 0 0.036. And the upper bound will be 0 0.369 plus 0 0.036. So this winds up being, according to my calculations here, 0 0.333 or 33.3%. And the upper bound is equal to 0 0.405 or 40.5%. So what we're saying here is that the uh, uh, the prediction of the election result for the Liberals should be somewhere between, they've got a 95%, 19 times out of 20, 95% chance that the true number is somewhere between 33.3% and 40.5%. Now you can look up if you're curious in the on, on Wikipedia or in the uh, in the news to in the Google to find out what the actual result percentage results of the federal liberals were on the election in uh, 19th. Of I, I want to make some final points here about uh, about this process we're describing because this is often one use of confidence intervals for. Uh, making predictions for elections, a referendum, and so on, is that very important point here is that the size of the original population doesn't change any calculation that I just did. So in effect, what this means is whether it's a survey in the United States with a population of 350 million or a population of Quebec, 7 million, 8 million, uh, the sample size doesn't change, and it doesn't change the confidence interval. And at first glance, this is... This is um, not intuitive. You might say, well, surely the sample size should depend on the population, and it's not the case. And a good way to think about this a little bit is, imagine you're making a large pot of soup or chili, and you're, you want to test it before uh, you finish putting spices in so that you, you like the taste. And whether it's a large pot of chili or a small pot of chili, you, you, the sample you take, a small spoon, it, it, it doesn't doesn't change anything. Uh, what's what's more important, if you think about it, is that you stir the pot before you take your sample. So you want a truly independent or random sample of the pot, but the, the sampling spoon doesn't have to be larger because you have a larger pot. And it's the same logic here in the case of uh, uh, the sample size for a, a, a media poll. Uh, another point, too, is we can now very simply at the 95% level, 19 times out of 20 is the frequently used, the margin of error is going to simply equal one plus or minus 1.96 times uh, 0 0.5, 
the largest standard error, or the uh, largest uh, population standard deviation um, possible, divided by the square root of the, the sample size. So I just, sake of argument, I just tried different sample sizes to find out what the margin of error would be. And what you discover is that when the sample size and again, bear in mind that this is going to be true whether it's the entire world, the United States, or the city of Montreal. It doesn't matter about the population size. If the sample size is, say, 300 or so, the margin of error is just too wide. It doesn't provide enough information uh, uh, about the accuracy. It's a bit like making the horseshoe just too big, so you're going to always hit the target. And, and, and so as a result, you don't know really where the true target is, the true pie, the true population proportion. On the other hand, you can go to a large sample of 2,000, but then it becomes very expensive to conduct the poll and ensure that it's truly a random sample. So most polls typically are around 1,000 or so. The one we just looked at is about 730. Uh, I often think that if it's below 5, it's just simply too small. Um, 1,000 is a fairly good size. 2,000 is good. It's more precise, but it's also very expensive. So maybe the polling organization has a lot of money to, to spend. Mm-hmm.